Maybe it's happened to you. You're in the shower or getting dressed and you look down and you see a little dick and it's all swollen and engorged with blood. And you freak out and you tell someone, I have a little dick on me and I want your help getting it off. I want you to grab this little dick as close to my skin as possible and pull on it slowly but firmly until it all comes out. And then you take that dick to the doctor and you show them and you ask, is this little dick dangerous? They'll tell you, there are two main kinds of dicks, soft dicks and hard dicks, and there are many diseases they can carry. But it is Lyme disease that is the most common and widespread in the world. The ticks responsible for the spread of Lyme are a few species of very similar hard ticks in the genus Ixodus. But before you start throwing blame around, you should know that it's complicated. It's a story with blood, saliva, small rodents, everything you need for a good bedtime read. And here is where it starts. This is Tina, and she is just hatching out of her egg as a tick larva. Right now she looks a bit like demon fingers. Now ticks are arachnids and arachnids have eight legs, but as a larva Tina only has six. And she is very tiny, about the size of the head of a pin. At the time of her birth, Tina is completely free of the bacteria that causes Lyme, because mama ticks cannot give it to their babies. So at this point in her life, she could give you a good sucking and you wouldn't get it. Yes, it sounds rude, but it is a sucking, isn't it? Because Tina is a parasite that specializes in eating blood. And she can't help that. Even if she wanted an avocado from Mexico, she couldn't eat it. Not with her crazy ass mouth parts. Sorry, not with her crazy ass mouth parts. We'll get to that in a minute, but first. Sorry, but first. Jerry, you have to proofread these. But first, how does little Tina acquire the Lyme bacteria in the first place? Or do anything, for that matter? Well, for starters, she will need to eat. Tina will only eat three meals in her whole life, which can be a few years long. So the first one has to be a good breakfast. Now, you've probably noticed that she's not much of a sprinter. She also doesn't have any eyes so she's a bit more of a right place at the right time sort of hunter. Each of her front legs has a special organ called Haller's organ. It can sense moisture, heat, and molecules that help Tina position herself in the likely path of a small animal. If a bird or lizard or rodent passes by, she grabs on. In this case, her first meal is from a mouse. She attaches and starts eating with the crazy mouth parts, we'll get to that in a minute, but what she doesn't realize is that this mouse is what is called a competent host of Borrelia burgdorferi, one of the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. A competent host means that the bacteria can live inside the mouse, avoiding its immune system but without making the mouse sick. Here's what Borrelia burgdorferi looks like, named after Willy Burgdorfer by the way, good name to be named after. You know, you don't want to be named after Eric Dyrarira. No one wants to be Borrelia Dyrarirai. <laughs> it is a spirochete, a twisty spaghetti noodle sort of bacterium. Now here's the problem. The bacteria live inside the mouse, but the mouse is going to die at some point. So for the bacteria to live on as a species, it needs to have a way to infect other competent hosts. And this is where Tina comes in. This bacteria has evolved to use ticks exclusively to find new hosts. Tina is sort of like a spaceship that helps it colonize new planets. As Tina eats, the bacteria enters her tummy parts and they attach to the lining of her midgut. Look at that, you can see right through her. Once there, they go into a kind of low energy state, sort of like those suspended animation pods that astronauts use in science fiction movies. After three days of feeding, Tina is about the size of a poppy seed. With her little bacteria travelers on board, she drops back to the ground to digest and to get ready for the next phase of her life as a nymph. Her nymph body develops inside that swollen ass thing that you really want to pop like a zit. When she emerges, she now has her fourth pair of legs. As a nymph, she will have meal number two, and this is where it gets interesting. The bacteria are rooting for Tina to pick another competent host so they can infect it and keep multiplying. It's like astronauts hoping to land on an Earth-like planet. But Tina can also feed from incompetent hosts. These include some lizards and all ruminants, like deer and cattle. If Tina feeds from one of these incompetent hosts, their blood and immune system will kill off the Lyme bacteria, ridding Tina of the infection. That's right, a deer tick doesn't get Lyme from a deer. This means that depending on her food preference, an infected nymph will either stay infected or be cured. 
For example, exoded ticks in the southeast of the United States prefer lizards, and therefore lime is uncommon. In the northeast, they prefer rodents, and lime is everywhere. Now, Tina could also choose a third category of host, which includes people and dogs. In this case, the tick remains infected but gets a good meal. For everyone else, it's a bummer. To the bacteria, we are a dead end. Once inside of us, it has no chance of infecting anything else. And our immune system goes completely batshit crazy trying to deal with it. Anyway, Tina the nymph chooses an uninfected mouse. To see how she transmits the disease, we'll have to look at her crazy ass mouth parts. Told you, <laughs> this is what toilet paper looks like in hell. But first, a brief message about our sponsor. I'm going to lead with this. Curiosity Stream is only $14.99 for an entire year. Even if you don't know what it is, you're probably thinking, what could possibly be so affordable? Is it a half of a shoe? No, I'll tell you what it is. Curiosity Stream is a collection of thousands of documentaries and non-fiction programs that you can stream to any device. Not a toaster, but everything at not a vacuum either. They also have original programming. They just released one called Doug to the Rescue. It's about Doug. That's him, not the puppy, the person. He uses drones with infrared cameras on them to find and rescue animals trapped by fires and hurricanes. You probably don't do that, but you can watch him do it. Curiosity Stream is only $14.99 for the whole year. I'm a fan and happy to have their support. Use code ZEFRANK to sign up. Where were we? Oh, right, this crazy thing. But let's back up a second. Many other blood feeders, like the Muscoito, are quite precise. They poke their mouth parts directly into a blood vessel and let the host's heart pump the blood for them. Ticks, on the other hand, do it differently. They are pool feeders or telmophages. It's sort of like when you're on the beach and you dig a hole and then it fills up with water. Imagine that, but with blood <laughs> that you then drink. <laughs> But digging in skin is a little more challenging than digging a hole in the sand. When you're the size of a tick, skin is more like a loose mesh of fibers. Imagine having to tunnel into a giant ball of cotton. To dig, Tina uses these, a pair of calissary. Each one can telescopically extend and bend at the tip. By employing a sort of alternate swimming type motion, they pull the matrix of the skin apart. Tina secretes saliva, which contains proteins that numb the area and suppress the immune system, but also cause tissues to start breaking down. When things have been loosened up a bit, both calissary extend, bend at the tips, and pull at the same time. This drives that central barbed thing called the hypostome deeper into the skin. The hypostome seems to act as an anchor, holding on with all those backward-facing barbs. And backward-facing barb is a good pornography name. As fluid from the damaged tissues begin to pool, Tina's mouth sucks it up using a muscular pump. When the first bits of the meal hit the midgut, it seems that the bacteria wake up. Instead of going out through the mouth, which is kind of swimming against the current, the bacteria make their way through the gut wall to the salivary glands, and it's through the saliva that the bacteria enter the host. It can take more than 24 hours of feeding for the bacteria to move to the salivary glands, so if you pull it off early enough, you can avoid the disease. Anyway, after her second meal, Tina is ready for her final molt into her adult form. Males and females look virtually identical in their larval and nymphal stages, but as adults, they differ. Females are larger, and males have shorter, stubbier mouth parts. This is because the adult male will not eat again, and instead will use his mouth parts for mating. You'll see. As an adult, Tina will only attach to larger animals, because this meal is a big one. Climbing up tall grasses gives her a better shot at big animals. Well now, it seems that Tina has found herself a mate. Here you can see the smaller male position himself to initiate mating. He aligns his jagged mouth parts with the female's genital pore, as is the custom. After some prodding around and if the vibe is right, he inserts his mouth parts into the genital pore, as is the custom. Well, I know it's blurry, Jerry. You can't hire a good pornographer to film this. It's too small. You need tiny instruments. Now pay attention. While he's doing that, he exudes a sort of liquidy sac called a spermatophore out of his genital opening. You can see it right there. It looks a bit like a white balloon. Then he deposits his sperm into it. You know, you wouldn't hire him to be a birthday clown. When the spermatophore is loaded and ready, he pulls his mouth parts out. Then he pulls the spermatophore over to her genital pore and attaches it. 
It's like meeting someone who really, really doesn't understand how to use a condom. Carbon dioxide inside the spermatophore actively pushes the sperm into the female tick. Males can do this two to three times and often meet with females who are in the process of feeding. It's like a theme restaurant. <laughs> this last feeding is a doozy. When she detaches after a week or so of feeding, Tina is 200 times her starting weight. This final meal will be used to create her babies. And there's a lot of them. These will be the only eggs that she lays, and they are tiny and vulnerable to dehydration. But she has a special organ called Janae's organ that makes its appearance during the egg-laying process. It looks a bit like a handlebar mustache made out of gummy worms. You can see it right here. As eggs emerge from her ovipositor, Janae's organ catches them between those horns. Janae's horny organ then coats them with a waxy secretion, which helps them cluster together and keeps them moist. Tina will lay up to 2,000 eggs, and when she's done, she will die. Jerry, how long is this clip? Does it just, it just keeps going? Well, no, I know she lays a lot of eggs. I just didn't think we'd watch every single one. I mean, it's less dramatic. And then she will die. That's a fade to black. What do you mean, who eats them? Oh, you mean the ticks? Well, I'll tell you one thing. A chicken will eat a tick. Oh, sure. Chickens will eat ticks all day. Oh, you should see them. Their little heads bobbing up and down. They'd eat a whole bag of ticks if they could. A whole bag of ticks. This booby kitty got a cute booty. Let's take it off like we're on a race. I wanna see boobies like we're in a bee movie. All right. This booby kitty got a cute booty. Look at that, Jerry. They have an anal groove. What do you mean, Steely Dan? Jerry, it's not a genre of music. This booby kitty got a cute booty. Let's take it off like we're on a race. I wanna see boobies. 